instance, making a decision between listening to good music and bad music. Uh, there are arguments to be made to listen to both of them, whether or not you want to do a cultural study on Justin Bieber or not. Uh, but it still forces a choice in the same way that the counter plan forces a choice between a counter plan and the affirmative plan. <laughs> I beg to differ. Uh, we'll move on. We'll most effective weapon that the negative has to offer in their entire arsenal. Uh, anyone, without looking over the board and cheating, tell me why counter plans might be good for the negative. Exactly. They can solve the entirety of the affirmative case in many cases while getting something called a net benefit, which is something that is better, uh, that the negative can solve that the affirmative can't solve, preferably for the negative. Uh, Counter plans also force the affirmative to have to defend the specificity of their ad. For instance, if the plan is to fund asteroid detection technology, the ad should be prepared to defend why all of that idea is a good idea, as opposed to the counter plan, which could pick out of some uh, small part of the plan, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, it is my opinion that there should always be a counter plan in the debate. Uh, Logan talked about JKing arguments yesterday and how you can make certain arguments go away. Counter plans are a lot easier to make go away than disads and even some critiques. Uh, I think that even if you are not serious about going for a counter plan, there should at least be one in the debate because one thing that counter plans do that other arguments can't do is that they pressure the affirmative because the app has to deal with the fact that the negative can take the entirety of what they said in the 1AC and turn it against them. So why should the negative get a counter plan? Uh, the first reason is theoretical. Uh, we want to have a high bar for change. We don't just want one lousy option or the status quo. We want multiple different options to evaluate because we want to institute the best policy that we can possibly get. Uh, is the plan always the best way to solve the advantages? Probably not. There are things called advantage counter plans that test the internal links to affirmative advantages that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, the second reason is fairness. Uh, there are lots of fairness norms in debate. You guys are going to talk about that a lot with topicality, and you're going to talk about it a lot in your labs on uh, theory debates and whatnot. Uh, but it's hard for the negative to get up and say that the status quo is always superior to the plan. It's hard for disads to outweigh sometimes. And so in order to provide fair ground for the debate, negatives have generally been allowed counter plans and diverse counter plans in recent years, even though some old school judges probably still uh, don't think that applies. Uh, the third reason is an educational one. Obviously, we talked about this before. Uh, the more options you have to compare, the more in-depth you can go on why uh, and how to solve certain problems like asteroids approaching the Earth to destroy it. And uh, right, that's that. But negatives get counter plans, but do they get any counter plan they want? Does anyone here think that it's okay for the negative to get up and fiat that the United States federal government will never go to war with anybody in the future? Not Lee Quinn. Right. There are limits that are placed on counter plans to make it fair for the affirmative, because just like counter plans are allowed for the negative to compete in fair, equal ground, it's also reciprocal for the app to place limits on the counter plan so that it's not abusive to the affirmative team. Uh, can anyone bring up an idea of a counter plan that you think might be illegitimate or bad for the negative to get that is run a lot? Not, not staff members. The 50 states counter plan has been popular in recent years. Uh, can anyone think of a reason why the states counter plan uh, would be maybe bad? Patrick? You're saying that 50 states will all decide, like 50 states and like Guam will all decide to do the exact same thing. Well, can I get a show of hands who debated the topic last year? And who debated the topic the year before that when the states counter plan was in every other debate? Right. Uh, I'll talk more about what the structure of a counter plan is later, but the gist of the state's counter plan was that instead of the federal government doing the plan, which is basically in every resolution, the entirety of the 50 states should come together and create a uniform policy uh, to do the same thing as the affirmative plan. A lot of reasons why people say this is bad is because it's unpredictable and it's not real world because the states can't all come together and make the same policy. Uh, one question that the negative should always ask themselves and one thing that they should make sure that they're prepared to answer is to make sure that they know that the counter plan, or they can defend that the counter plan does not make it too hard for the affirmative to win. Obviously, if there is a utopian based counter plan, like end world hunger or never go to war with another country, that makes it way too hard for the affirmative to get any kind of leverage because you can't compete against a perfect policy. Uh, it's also a question of what we allow the negative to run. I'm going to talk to you guys in a little bit about what theory debating is, but theory debate is essentially a question of the limits that you place on the negative counter plan and the uh, ways in which they should and should not be able to run that counter plan. Uh, it's also uh, too important to note that this also uh, plays into fairness. I mentioned this earlier uh, because obviously if it is not a fair debate, we cannot get a good two-sided discussion of the issue.
I also want to say that if you have any questions at any point in this lecture, feel free to interrupt me mid-sentence, raise your hand, throw something at me. I'll also try my best to make it ring candy. I, some of you already answered questions and candy. There you go. And if you, you have enough candy, you'll six pieces of what? How do you run a counter plan? Counter plans usually have a very similar structure uh, to most other counter plans. Uh, for instance, uh, you have to have a text like the affirmative plan. Uh, you all have something called a plan text in your 1AC of the asteroid mapping that says something along the lines that the USFG should fund asteroid detection technology. A counter plan text needs to be similar in that. And also, if you're trying to do something that's similar to the affirmative, make sure that you word it the same way as the affirmative plan, uh, but excluding part of it that you want to claim net benefits off of. For instance, the counter plan that's in your packet is the EU counter plan, which essentially which simply has uh, the EU do the plan instead of the, uh, instead of the United States. Uh, you should always provide a solvency author. Uh, not, I guess not always, I put usually there because sometimes in the middle of a debate round you'll have a really good idea that seems really intuitive and you might want to do that off the fly and you might not have a card to back it up, but it's at least uh, worth introducing to the debate. Um, anyone think of a reason why the negative should have a solvency author for their counter Exactly. You have to make sure that you can prove that the counter plan is something that people who know what they're talking about would endorse. Any idiot can get up and say that uh, we should do something about the energy <coughs> crisis. Can the counter plan be the United States federal government should do something about the energy crisis? No, you have to have a specific policy outline the same way the affirmative plan is do. The counter plan must also compete. Does anyone know what counter plan competition is?
counter plan that the negative would offer or that your friends would offer would be that instead of seeing, go, going to see a movie, oh, we should probably go to dinner, there's not really anything good out, I'm really hungry anyway, I have a lot of money to spend, burn a hole in my pocket. Uh, how would someone make these two options competitive? What would be something that would force a choice between those two options? You wouldn't have to spend enough money. Exactly. If you don't have enough money to do both of those things, then obviously it forces a choice between the entirety of the plan and the entirety of the counter plan. Uh, what would a net benefit be to the counter plan of going to dinner? You wouldn't be hungry anymore? Exactly. You wouldn't be hungry anymore. And hopefully you walk after this. But, uh, I already talked about visual exclusivity. Uh, there are three tests to prove the net benefits to the counter plan. Uh, the negative has the burden to prove three different things. First is that the counter plan is better than the plan itself. If the counter plan and the plan are evaluated side by side, they obviously need to win that the counter plan as an entire package is better than the plan as an entire package. Simple enough, no questions about that. Uh, they also have to win that the counter plan is better than the plan and the counter plan. I'm gonna talk about permutations in a minute. I already told you guys uh, that's coming up. But uh, there are things called permutations where the app will try and say that we should do the plan and the counter plan at the same time because I don't know, it gets double solvency or it avoids the net benefit, etc. The third thing that the counter plan has to do is prove that the counter plan is superior to the plan plus part of the counter plan. I'm going to give you guys a few more examples in a few minutes, but we'll move on to this. Uh, can someone, does anyone know what a solvency deficit is to the counter plan before I move on? Right. The affirmative, whenever you're reading a counter plan, is mo more than likely going to get up and try and say that the counter plan doesn't solve a large part of the affirmative case, which is a solvency deficit. Uh, that means that the counter plan has to prove that the counter plan avoids those solvency deficits and is more beneficial than the affirmative plan. A lot of things that counter or the negatives say is that uh, the risk of the counter plan's net benefit outweighs the risk of the solvency deficit, and thus the counter plan is more desirable than the plan. For instance, the plan helps 10 people. If the counter plan helps nine people, and the affirmative team wins that there's no other substantial benefit to doing it, uh, then the judge is not going to feel persuaded to vote for the counter plan because the negative has not fulfilled the basic negative burden of proving why the counter plan is better than the affirmative plan and is probably going to result in an affirmative ballot. Uh, the second one we talked about is if the counter plan and the plan are both equally good, then who wins? Uh, let's say I want to go to dinner and a movie. Uh, the permutation is to go to both of those things. Obviously, if I have enough money that I can do it, I might not want to spend all the money, but I might have enough to feasibly go to both. The negative still has the option, has the burden to prove why the counter plan of going to dinner alone is better than a combination of going to a movie and dinner. Can someone think of a reason why it would be better just to go to, a, to dinner by itself than go to a movie and dinner? save a lot of it for other things, yeah, absolutely, it could be a reason. Uh, insurance? Um, yeah, you might have a really strict schedule and you might not be able to fit in a lot of stuff and you might be running late for another appointment. Uh, but yeah, those are all pretty good reasons about why the negative could say the counter plan would be better. The counter plan must also prove to be better than the plan plus any part of the counter plan. Uh, for instance, the plan is to go to the movies, counter plan, still dinner. The permutation could be a movie and only part of what I was going to eat at dinner. For instance, I'll only pay a couple of dollars for my dessert instead of the entire entree that I was going to get before I went to the movies. And the negative has to defend that the movie or that dinner in, in its entirety is better than a movie and uh, part of the dinner, which is dessert. Now I'm going to talk about types of counter plans. Uh, before I move on, does anybody have any questions so far that pertains to anything on the slides? One very common type of counter plan that uh, a lot of teams find very frustrating, but uh, nevertheless makes its way into a lot of debates, is a consult counter plan. Does anybody come up against a consult counter plan in their debate careers? Quite a few of you. Uh, consult counter plans are essentially counter plans that had the United States enter into what is called prior and binding consultation with another country, government, entity, organization, etc., on whether or not to pass the plan. Uh, if that country says yes, then the plan is usually implemented as a result of the counter plan, and if they say no, then it gets rejected, and the counter plan doesn't happen, the plan doesn't get passed, et cetera. For instance, my plan is to go to the movies. The counter plan would be to 
consult your parents about going to the movies? What would an epidemic have been to this be? Well, she said her parents are happy and they know you're safe. Your parents are happy. It might have improved relations in your relationship uh, with your family. Uh, this is probably obviously good for a few reasons. It might give you an increased allowance if they're seeing that you're caring about their opinion about your social life, etc. And maybe that gets you more money to spend on things like dinner and a movie. Um, on these types of counter plans, it's really important for the negative to win that whatever country they consult, or organization, NATO is one, the UN is one, that people consult a lot, uh, it's important for the negative to win that that country will say yes. Can anyone think of a problem to a consult counter, to a negative team that's reading a consult counter plan if the affirmative team wins and they say no? Asteroid funding does not happen because the other country has vetoed it, which means that the binding consultation that we've entered into has backfired because obviously the binding answer is that we cannot pass the affirmative plan. Uh, I still have truth to throw up here. Uh, some teams are going to consult uh, countries before a collaboration. The space topic, I know Ross talked to you guys about cooperation affirmatives. Uh, some countries uh, probably are going to be consulted by negative teams. For instance, if there is an affirmative, it says that the United States uh, must cooperate with China on other uh, space policies. And one counter plan might be to consult China before those things. Uh, it probably wouldn't solve very much. But that is an example of something that negative, team, that negative teams could uh, explore. Um, do you guys think that consult counter plans are competitive? Yes. They're theoretically competitive. They're theoretically competitive. Or no, why do you think they're not competitive?
competition questions uh, that overlap between consult and condition counter plans, uh, but condition counter plans are their own beast in their own right. Uh, it is also important to win that whatever host country would accept the conditions of the counter plan. Obviously, if we consult China about whether or not we want to do the plan, that might hurt relations or whatever. In a condition counter plan, if China says no, the plan still doesn't pass, which means that there's no solvency for asteroid mapping, asteroid mining, whatever the affirmative plan is. Another very common type of counter plan is the agent counter plan. I know if you guys debated condition counter plans, you've probably had to debate agent counter plans at least once or twice, right? Agent counter plans, we've all basically been debated before. Uh, an agent counter plan is a counter plan that uses a different agent to actually do the affirmative plan. Uh, for instance, three branches of government that the app usually uses, if not the United States federal government as a whole, is the executive, legislative, or judicial branches. Has anyone ever debated the executive order counter plan? Yes. Kind of an annoying counter plan sometimes, I know. The Supreme Court counter plan. The Congress counter plan. These things are all really common. Can anyone think of a, a net benefit to these kind of counter plans? teams will say that uh, an executive counter plan or that has Obama sign an executive order to do the plan instead of all the federal government doing the plan, we say that avoids politics because it bypasses Congress. Because Obama just writes stuff down on a piece of paper, says the plan is law, the executive order goes into effect, it's not debated in Congress, thus doesn't trade off with other items on the agenda. Uh, the example I have up here is the court's counter plan. Uh, instead of the United States federal government acting as a whole, a lot of negative teams will interpret that if the resolution says United States federal government, then the affirmative has to defend all of the United States federal government. Uh, so they'll say that our competition is that we use only one part of it. We use the courts, we don't use all the other branches, and thus the counter plan competes. Uh, another net benefit that we didn't talk about just now is presidential powers. Uh, these things are also not necessarily disadds to the affirmative plan, but they are things that the counter plan would solve that the affirmative plan couldn't solve. Did anyone think of a reason why an executive order counter plan would solve presidential powers better than just generic, like generic U.S. and G policy? Patrick? Partially, uh, one reason as to why the counter plan by itself in the world of the, the in, one thing the negative wants to prove in the world of counter plan is that the counter plan by itself is better. Obviously, if the executive acts on his own, that is a broader and better example of executive power and presidential power than the entirety of the USFG Act. For instance, if the executive acts along with the legislative and judicial branch, it is not perceived as an executive policy and thus does not increase presidential powers. Uh, my favorite type of counter plan uh, is an advantage counter plan. Have you guys debated against advantage counter plans in high school? Really something I like to see debated more in high school uh, but I digress. Advantage counter plans are counter plans that test the internal links to the affirmative advantages, uh, usually without doing large parts of the affirmative plan. Um, I mentioned earlier there are not always one way to solve problems. The app is not the only way to solve for asteroids. Uh, a SPS app is not the only way to solve hegemony or global warming. Uh, there are different things that the negative can do uh, to put together in a sort of grab bag counter plan. Uh, that would solve the affirmative advantages better without doing a space policy. But, uh, big point. Uh, for instance, if there's a soft power advantage in the 1AC, there are lots of things that the negative can do to counter plan to solve that. For instance, the death penalty is something that is very contentious in the international community. A lot of countries really look down on the U.S. for still having the death penalty uh, in widespread use. Guantanamo Bay, still largely active. Uh, we could give billions in poverty assistance to Africa, obviously it would help the U.S. international image in the eyes of a lot of countries. The point is, there is not one way to any advantage. And counter plans, uh, there are advantage counter plans, allow the negative to catch up without necessarily engaging in a space policy. Uh, we call these grab bag counter plans. We also call them spider counter plans because they have lots of different planks or legs. Uh, advantage counter plans are usually longer uh, in their text than other counter plans, but they also still probably need a solvency advocate to prove that the counter plan planks uh, solve just as well as the affirmative planks. Um, can anyone tell me why an advantage counter plan might compete or why it might force a choice between the affirmative plan and the advantage counter plan? Can anyone think of any net benefits <coughs> to advantage counter plans? Okay. Uh, one of the reasons why advantage counter plans are so good is that it allows you to solve the app impacts without
without doing anything that's specific to the resolution. For instance, if there's a solar powered satellite's affirmative with a warming and hegemony uh, advantages, then the negative can get up and say that we have nothing to do with space policy. We uh, close Guantanamo Bay down, that solves hegemony, and we fund renewable technology, uh, and that solves global warming. That's something that doesn't link to any disad that you have that's based off of the plan or based off of space policy. For instance, if you read cards specific to space policy that says that space policy uh, uniquely exacerbates the deficit, but that uh, spending on renewable or green energy doesn't, then that's net beneficial and a reason why the counter plan avoids the disad. Uh, obviously, the negative burden is to prove that it has a net benefit, so you have, it probably helps to have a disadvantage uh, that the counter plan likes to avoid that the act doesn't. Advantage counter plans are very useful against new advantages. Can anyone think of a reason why that might be true? No. Uh, advantage counter plans allow you uh, ways to uh, avoid space policy discussions and avoid those kind of debates uh, while testing new affirmative advantages. For instance, whenever we hit new advantages that other teams were reading, uh, it was always easier for us to have some kind of counter plan on standby ready to solve that than it was to come up with a generic counter plan that we had not prepared for this specific debate. A lot of times the affirmative is going to have new things that you are not prepared for and you don't have a lot of impact defense or answers to, so a good option is to counter plan out of those things and make sure that you do something to solve those things so you don't have to worry about uh, sneaky app uh, impact that you don't have answers to sticking by and outweighing your disad when you uh, could have just read an advantage counter plan to solve it. There are some counter plans that are specific on this topic. Uh, for instance, I don't know if Ross talked about private actors or not, uh, but one thing that negative teams are going to do is say that instead of the federal government acting as a whole, we should have private actors implement a space policy instead, like SpaceX, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, etc. Those companies have lots of uh, space technology, lots of funding that they could give to implement new technologies. Uh, can anyone think of a reason why these might be better uh, than federal government policy? Sure. Uh, any kind of dissent based off of federal action? Uh, would certainly be avoided by these counter plans. If you were to read a uh, fiscal discipline dissent or a spending dissent that's based off of federal government action, then that's something that a private actor counter plan would claim as a net benefit. Have you guys come up against private actor counter plans yet in your discussions in your lab? Uh, 
some certain type of technology uh, that would be bad because China would perceive that type of technology as a space race to build space weapons, etc. So the negative would say that we should do all of the affirmative plan except for X satellite. Because China perceives X satellite as hostile, they'll start building nuclear weapons and we go to war with China, and that's the negative benefit. That's the reason why the counter plan is competitive. Um, I gave examples earlier. Agent counter plans are a type of these. The tech exclusion counter plan I just gave. There are also things that he might be a little more interested in this, uh, but there are things called word picks. Uh, believe it or not, when you read a plan text, most judges think that you have to defend all the parts of that plan text and that you have to be uh, held to it, that the affirmative cannot sever anything. Can anyone think of a reason why that's good? Why the AF shouldn't be able to get up and say, never mind, I'm part of our plan? Yeah, it's probably because after we target some shit. Okay. Yeah, it, it basically is cheating. Uh, if the AF's allowed to sever what their entire advocacy was that they started with, it makes it really hard for the negative to compete, to compete against that. Uh, these are often very hard to permute. Like I mentioned earlier, it's hard for you to say that, uh, you're right, I should be held to all the affirmative plan, we fund all asteroid launch technology, but if her do the counter plan, uh, we should exclude part of it. The app cannot say that because they are, by nature, uh, bound to the affirmative plan. Uh, picks are one of the best ways to force the app to defend the specifics of their plan. I mentioned earlier that one of the burdens of the negative is to try and disprove, or, or try and capture all the affirmative uh, in a way that's not beneficial. So the app has to prove why specifically what they do is good, which means if the negative can find a way to improve it and exclude part of it or improve part of it, then they've done their job to fulfill the negative burden of offering a competitive counter plan uh, that's superior. Uh, these are generally theoretically legitimate. Most judges think these are pretty good and educational uh, because they determine the search for the best policy option, etc. We'll talk more about that when we talk about theory. Okay. We're going to get into something kind of complicated now. It's the status of the counter plan. I mentioned earlier that there are things the app should do to limit how the negative should be able to read counter plans. Uh, have you guys ever been involved in counter plan theory debates or critique theory debates? Uh, theory debates are generally pretty common. Uh, regarding the status of the counter plan, one thing that the app should always ask the negative, and write this down, in cross-sex, when you are affirmative, and they read a counter plan in the 1 and C, you ask, what is the status of the counter plan? This is very important because it determines when the negative can kick the counter plan, and when they can say, JK, like Logan said, and make it leave the debate, never has to come back, the app uh, has that much less to worry about. Uh, one way that the negative can read their counter plan or one way they can run it, one status that they can have, is unconditional. Do you guys know what unconditionality is in terms of counter plan? Yeah, the, if, if the negative says their counter plan is unconditional, that means they have to go for the counter plan at the end of the debate regardless of the answer the affirmative makes, regardless of what else happens. Uh, people don't usually read their counter plans this way because obviously you want flexibility as the negative to go for whatever you want, and if the app has a lot of answers on the you want to be able to say, not going for the counter plan, I'm going for disadvantage case defense, so we want to keep the counter plan, it's not the debate anymore. This is a reason why you need to make sure that you know what the status of the counter plan is, and that you would probably repeat it after they tell it to you so that the judge, it's clear the judges said, they said the counter plan was unconditional. That means they cannot kick it. Uh, if a team lies to you in round, it's easy to make a theoretical reason to reject them because they essentially lied to you to skew your strategy, which is probably unfair. If they're someone who is cheating in most sports, then generally they are punished by losing whatever competition it is they're in or whatever other harsh penalty they might lose, speaker points or uh, whatever. But it's always important to make sure you determine how the counter plans run, and as the negative, you want to make sure that you are reading the counter plan in a status that you are comfortable with. You do not want to say unconditional just for the heck of it, because you don't want to be stuck with it and uh, have the app uh, bait you into going for something that they don't really prepare against. The most common way that counter plans are run uh, is conditionally. Conditionality, I'm sure a lot of you know what it is if you've been in a theory debate, it was probably a conditionality debate. Uh, or a consult counterplay in bad, good debate. Uh, the negative, uh, when they're reading a conditional counterplay, says they can kick the counterplay whenever they want, regardless of the arguments that the app team makes. Doesn't matter, we can, even if you read 
eight minutes of arguments on the counter plan, I have the option to kick it and go for disadd and go for another uh, counter plan, etc. Do you want to have any question on conditionality?
hard to answer other than that in terms of competition. Uh, so permutations can be uh, your best friend to compete against those kind of comp plans because a lot of my favorite ways to beat uh, consult counter plans, et cetera, consult NATO, I think are permutations. You have to be creative with the type of permutations you make, but I'll get to those uh, on their own separate slide. We touched on this before. We're not going to spend a lot of time here because it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you should always make solvent differences as the 2AC to the counter plan. You need to say that consult counter plans don't solve asteroid mapping because an asteroid will hit the Earth in a short amount of time. Uh, it's probably unlikely that's true. Uh, but you need to make some uh, argument that the plan solves something that the counter plan doesn't solve. Uh, so if there's a time frame differential between the plan and the counter plan, you need to say in the 2AC time frame differential, there's a risk that our impacts will happen in the short time frame that it takes for the counter plan to go into effect. For instance, if we were to consult another country, if we were to consult all the member states of NATO, that would probably take a very long time. Something bad could have very well happened by then. And so we have an obligation to act now, do the affirmative plan now, as opposed to waiting to consult China in the future. This allows the act to leverage the case against the counter plan. Uh, a lot of times, two ARs are going to come down to questions of impact calculus and who solves what the best. If you can have a sufficient solvency deficit to the counter plan, it is easier for the act to get up and say that our impacts come first, even if they win all of their disad impact, we still outweigh because they can't access the huge impacts that our plan can. Make sense? Right, for instance, an EU counter plan would not be able to solve for US space leadership or any kind of technology that authors say that only the US can afford or only the US can spur other countries to invest in. Uh, is a good solve step to the counter plan. That means that there's a huge disad to the counter plan uh, that the app solves. Uh, be sure that the solvency takeout argument doesn't also apply to the case. You don't want to go up against a counter plan that does the same thing as the plan, but have the EU fund asteroid mapping, and then say in the 2AC is a response to the counter plan, then more funding can't solve asteroid mapping technology. Because obviously, while you certainly have taken out the counter plan, you've also taken out your own solvency. So make sure it's a reason why the counter plan by itself is a, is a worse idea than the plan. Theory. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, theoretical objections are ways the affirmative can attack the type of counterplan that the negative reads, or the way and the status in which they read it, or the number of counterplans you will read. Uh, for instance, a lot of teams read multiple counterplans, two, three, even counterplans, to test the affirmative plan. And a lot of times, it makes it really hard for the 2AC to get up and answer all those things. So, uh, if you can prove that the counterplan is theoretically illegitimate, is unfair, then you could probably have a good avenue towards winning the debate. A lot of judges are not going to make a theoretical objection necessarily a voting issue in every instance, but it is a good way to scare the negative off of going for a counterplan or to pressure the negative to where they have to undercover the substance of it. A good trick to do on counterplans is to bait the negative into having to answer either a lot of substance or a lot of theoretical objection arguments and then go for whichever one they undercover. A lot of negative teams do this, or a lot of app teams do this, after uh, a smart or tricky uh, one ar to pressure them. Uh, if you do go for these theory arguments, you generally need to explain why it is a voting issue if you want to get any kind of traction that does not just reject the counterplan. Uh, you have to win that if the counterplan is a bad idea, you have to have impacts to those theoretical objections. Just like in your advantages, just like in a disadvantage, you have to have impacts to why those kind of counterplans are good or bad for debate. For instance, if someone, if the negative were to read a counterplan to end world hunger, why would that be a voting issue uh, that the affirmative could make to the judge? Yeah, yeah but why, why might utopia and fiat be a reason to vote affirmative against the negative? Uh, that, that's part of it. It's not real world, it's not practical, it doesn't test the affirmative. Uh, but a lot of theoretical objections are reasons why that the app says that the negative was abusive in their strategy, or they made it to where we could not win, or they skewed the debate in some way. That means that they have inherently put us at a disadvantage that they are not subject to themselves. For instance, a lot of teams are going to make the argument this year, you will hear this argument, you will hear it at the camp uh, tournament, you will hear it in your individual labs, that international fiat is bad to voting issue. Can someone think of a reason without looking at cheating? why international fiat uh, might be something that the app would say is illegitimate in a voting issue. Hey, you can cheat. Not legal. All right. It might be unpredictable if the negative gets to open the floodgates and use any actor in the international community, 
And that makes it pretty hard for the app to have to research every potential country who could do the plan instead of the app. For instance, it's going to be hard for you to find uh, any kind of evidence that's comparative about the plan that says that Estonia should not do the plan, obviously. Uh, another reason is that it's not reciprocal. Uh, does everyone know, like, concept of reciprocity, that uh, if the negative gets to do something, then the app should also uh, be allowed to kind of leeway in that regard as well? A lot of things that the app could say is that it's not reciprocal because the app only gets to use domestic actors within the United States, and so the negative should be held to that same thing. Our interpretation for the kind of counterplans you get is that you get a counterplan that's any domestic actor. You get any advantage counterplan based off USFG action. You get any US-based private actor. You do not get to fiat that another country takes an action. Uh, theory is a prior issue uh, than whether or not the counterplan is a better idea than the plan. If 